Hi, Louie. <clears throat> can we try the radio? Are you? Tell me if okay. you can hear this. Uh, tell me if you can hear hear the audio on this. So how how was the sound? Louis, did you hear the music? Hi. Hi, uh, did you hear the recording? I did not hear it. Okay. Uh, hmm. Hum, hum, hum. Hello, Kent. Good. Uh, it's still morning. Good morning, Sue. I want to have you help me try this. Louie wants me to play a um, old radio tune, and I'm trying to get it to work on screen share, and I'm trying to figure it out here. Okay. So help see if you can hear it. Not hearing. I, I hear something very garbled. Hmm. 
You hear something garbled? Just, and it was like uh, maybe a tenth of a second. I mean, it was real quick. You hear something garbled? Is that what I understand? Yes, but very, very briefly. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't um, clear? No. Do we need to do it? I don't know. Yeah. Do we need to do it on I'm our side? For trying. Oh, well, if you can hear me, it's a screen share. And it should have. It's as loud as I can get it on on the screen share. Let me see again. How about stopping it? And uh, are there any other? Uh, uh, What was that, Louie? Uh, what about any, are there any other controls that one could, the little dots that are next to the microphone on that icon? Yeah. Just says download. Oh, okay. I can try. Let me, let me see if that'll help. Hello, Sydney, if you're on. You there. Hello, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, we may We're just trying to get a little Karen. Maybe we can just here before. Uh, maybe we can do this. Uh, let's be just between the two of us uh, sometime okay. on a different. Well, let day. me try this one, and if it does, if it doesn't work, let me um, see here. How is that? I didn't hear anything. Did you hear that at all? No. Okay. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have to try it at some other time, Louie. I'm sorry. I don't know okay. what's, I, I'm at this moment out of options, so. Okay. Anyway, uh, Sydney, would you like to try your uh, PowerPoint? Yeah, let's give it a go here. I've got. Screen share should be working. Okay. Did you guys see this? Yeah. Yep. Yes. All that and you can hear me? Yep. yep. Perfect. Yep. Good deal. Well, now that I see it, I don't have to watch the program. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Are you back in the States or? I am, yeah, back in Newton, Iowa, where I was born and raised. <laughs> Good deal. All right. Let's go to that. There we go.
had the um, sound was not working for Louie's little ditty. So oh, we'll bummer. Into the welcome song. Sorry, I Louie. I, I tried the screen share and everything, and it just wasn't working. So. Mm. Well, we'll work it out sometime, Chad. There's a little trick in the, when you click on the allow sharing, Karen, there's also another yeah. step that says allow computer audio. Uh, close uh, to that, I, I, don't, try. I don't have that on my screen because I'm not the host, but it's somewhere in there when you allow sharing, there's a allow computer audio. There's a feature. I don't know if that's what it is or not. Yeah. I get the sharing on the options. I'd have to see. I think it's in the, yeah, somewhere in the details of the sharing or in that drop down area. Is it in the advanced? Yes, maybe. Yeah, I, I looked in the advanced sharing options and it, it just allows participants. Huh. And I'm not seeing anything about sound. About there's, a, there's that, a, squ so. a square at the bottom left that says share computer sound. Is that the one? That's the one. Where is that at? Bottom left. Of the advanced screen. Not of the screen share. Oops, I'm, I'm negligent in my duties. Video settings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it makes a difference whether you're using a PC or an Apple or an iMac. Yeah, Yeah, I'm not seeing what you're seeing, so it, it's mine. I don't know. I'm, I'd, I'll have to fiddle with it at some point in time. Karen, your image is a bit uh, jumpy and intermittent. Uh, do you have sort of a slow internet connection? Yes. That's it's telling me I do today. I don't know why, but I do. <clears throat> Louis, this is George speaking. Hey, I have two baby goats I rescued and I named one of them after you. <laughs> It's uh, the two are brothers. They're Leo, or uh, uh, let's see, Lincoln and Louis. It's a pretty high honor. <laughs> so you ought to come out sometime, wear your mask, and and meet your your goat named after you. <laughs> we're we're bottle feed, bottle feeding them twice a day. If you'd like to, you could do that. How old are they now? 
there two months. Get a picture of Louis feeding Louis if you yeah. could. Yeah, that'd be a good one. <laughs> Later arriving crowd today, but we're starting to ramp up. <clears throat> we'll give it just a, a couple more minutes here. Chad, I sent you a progress report from Rags that I wrote. Yes, I received that. I haven't had a chance to go through the details. I just wanted to keep you in and Karen informed. Thank you. <clears throat> Making sure we have all the, the important people. I know Sydney's here and she's tested out her screen and that's good and Liz is here and Louie is here. All the other 37 important people are here as well. So we'll, uh, yeah, looks like we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're at 39 participants, 40 now. Uh, no, it's still jumping up there. So first of all, Welcome to the uh, September 21st meeting of the Rotary Club of Ames. Excited to have all of you join us today for our virtual meeting. Uh, we have a great uh, agenda and uh, <clears throat> in true uh, Rotary Club of Ames fashion, first I'd like to invite Louie to unmute and then serenade us with the welcome song, if you would, Louie. I'll be happy to do that, and we'll save the little surprise that I had for you for uh, another time. So we'll uh, start with the Rotary. Louis, you muted. Okay, now I'm on. You got me. There we go. Okay, did you get a uh, surprise next time? Did you get that? We got that part. Okay, so here we go. Welcome to you from Ames Rotary, Nevada, London, or Gay Paris, from far off lands or the USA. We're glad that you are here today. Come back again whenever you're near. Join us and then we'll make it clear. Around the world you will always be. Welcome at Rotary. Wonderful. Thank you, Louis. Um, <clears throat> I have, uh, as usual, reserved a bit of time here at the beginning where we take a moment of silence for uh, people in our Rotary family or others who might need an extra thought. Uh, I have yet to hear of anyone yet this week within our club uh, that we need to specifically include. Uh, but there's a few, obviously, that we need to make sure uh, maybe we take an extra moment for. Uh, this week, we need to certainly remember um, our recently uh, deceased Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What a lifelong public servant uh, she has been for this country uh, and her sacrifices and her leadership. So we certainly uh, hold our country, uh, her family, and others uh, in our thoughts today. And uh, <clears throat> not sure if you're all aware or not, but last week we had a very uh, sad tragedy. Uh, we had a young, a young boy, uh, 16 years old, uh, with the Gilbert Community School District who took his own life. So uh, we just want to make sure that uh, the family of Henry Owen um, ask for your extra thoughts and prayers for the Owen family uh, members of our community uh, there are many people grieving uh, for Henry's loss and anytime you lose a young uh, boy like that for any reason it's sad but uh, that reason in particular so please keep the family of Henry Owen also in your thoughts and prayers 
And so uh, with that, we'll just uh, take a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, a couple of announcements here. Uh, <clears throat> I think if you'll look at your screen, uh, Karen has some slides, uh, some photographs to share. Maybe, I think. There we go. So, uh, the Miracle Field and Playground, what an awesome centennial project uh, that this has been for our club. There was a sneak peek gathering, unfortunately with just a few, uh, social distanced and masked as you can see uh, with board member Jeff Johnson on the swings. Uh, but uh, club members and friends, um, this is an amazing project. Uh, this is going to be and Ames, Iowa showcase for years to come. Um, it is uh, very impressive. Uh, I'm amazed at the opportunities this also is going to present uh, the Rotary Club of Ames and other organizations to serve. And we're hopeful, uh, stay tuned, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to gather there uh, if it works out uh, prior to uh, the weather turning too cold and maybe also get a club peak and maybe have a meeting or a gathering there as well. As you can see, here's a photograph of uh, the uh, major donors and there's many recognizable names and Rotary members specifically. And then also the Rotary Club of Ames has uh, a star uh, over on the right side there. And this banner will be placed on a permanent uh, structure as a part of the uh, uh, the field and playground as well. Um, so thank you uh, so far, right, to all the people, uh, past presidents, Dieter and Cressy um, and Karen and uh, members of our, uh, the foundation that also Lynn Carey and, and Jeff Isles and um, Amber Corrieri. I know there's people I'm forgetting, but thank you to all of those who are making this uh, quite a project uh, to remember. Don Borketing, also thank you. Um, so I appreciate all of you, your work there. Um, and uh, as we probably alluded to uh, a little bit last week, uh, our board is working on a hybrid meeting opportunity uh, in October and beyond, hopefully. So we're gonna be visiting with the Gateway uh, with uh, how we could potentially meet in person and continue to Zoom and record and enjoy the features of both. Uh, that's our plan, but we need to explore how that might work out starting in October. So stay tuned for more details for those who would like to uh, gather in a uh, obviously a safe manner and uh, in alignment with the rules and the regulations that the Gateway and the uh, the restaurant industry would have uh, for us as well. So stay tuned there. Um, four new wild cases of polio last week, uh, two in Pakistan and two in Afghanistan. So again, uh, struggling just to get those two countries uh, marked off our list. Um, and now I would like to uh, turn this over to uh, Liz Beck and Liz is going to unmute. Liz is going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Chad. I'm pleased to recognize uh, Sydney Bergman, who's joined us today. Sydney has finished her year um, as a Rotary Global Scholar for District 6000. She was at the London School of Economics. Um, she's actually currently in Newton now, and I think she, I know she graduated from the Newton High School, so she's in our district. Um, she graduated from Grinnell also, for those of you who are Grinnell graduates. Um, so you should recognize her and her work, uh, and especially pay attention to her for the work she's going to do. Um, she was at the London School of Economics, and her interest was peace and conflict studies, and she is particularly interested in North Africa. So she served as a researcher as an 
and an analyst at the um, Office of the Historian in the U.S. Department of State and focused on, help me out here, Sydney, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, is that close? Cote d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. Cote d'Ivoire, yep. And um, Sudan, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Djibouti. So her interest is really in how we can um, be um, engaged and productive in, in terms of peace and conflict in those specific areas. And um, she has worked in those areas. She's done what she can at the London School of Economics. And her path is leading her toward a career in foreign service. So Sydney, welcome to us. And the Ames Club is glad to have you. So. I'm gonna turn it over to you right now, thank you. Sounds good, thank you, Liz. All right, I'm gonna get my screen set up here. Let's see. All righty, so as Liz said, um, I'm Sydney Bergman, and I'm just gonna start off with just a little bit of background about me, um, where I'm from, how I grew up, just so you can get a little bit more introduction of who I am. So I grew up in Iowa on a farm. Um, we settled here around in the mid 19th century. Um, so we got over here in 1852 and then found Iowa and we've been there ever since on our farm 160 acres um, and this is just me as a little kid um, we raised hogs cattle chickens um, and of course corn and soybeans um, so just give you a little sense of kind of you know I've always been out messing around in the dirt that sort of stuff this is me we have a pond um, I always love fishing I was just up there recently at our pond caught a 14 inch bass about 20 pounds it was probably the best best bass we've got out of that pond so far. This is me, five, year, five years old. Um, caught a catfish there, pretty proud of that one. <laughs> and then again, here I am in high school. I raised a couple chickens myself. And that was one of my cows uh, split because of her ear there. Um, and uh, I was never in 4-H or FFA. I was more just kind of doing this for fun, kind of like a family thing. And uh, yeah, just a little bit about me there, background, family life. Um, so then growing up and then my undergraduate, um, I had a lot of interests in middle school and high school. I was um, a varsity athlete. I played volleyball and I ran track. Um, I was involved in theater, both at my high school as well as the community theater here in Newton. And I was in music. So I did the jazz band, pep band, uh, wind ensemble, and um, uh, marching band, especially too. Did that all of those things all four years, had a great time, learned a lot, engaged with a lot of different folks, um, really intellectually stimulating as well. Had a good time and uh, my senior year, I applied for what's called the Coca-Cola Scholarship. Um, it's from the Coca-Cola uh, company and their um, uh, foundation for the Coca-Cola Scholarship there. Its three main focuses are academic excellence, leadership and service. It's a nationwide scholarship program um, that uh, takes applicants from, from high school seniors all over the nation. It's very competitive. Um, and so then once I was accepted, it's a very long process as well. Lots of interviewing, that sort of stuff. Um, and then they flew us down for the Coca-Cola Scholarship Weekend. It was a banquet down there. Um, Dr. Condoleezza Rice was uh, the guest speaker. So I met her. A um, lot of very talented, talented um, peers that I, that I was able to engage with and hear their stories and what their goals were and all those sorts of things. It was a great, great experience as, as an 18-year-old. And then I went on to Grinnell College. Um, I majored um, in history and I received honors for that degree. Um, and while there, of course, I was an RA for three years um, and it was in the Grinnell Symphony Orchestra for four years. I did tons of internships during the summer and I was also, also a writing mentor and teaching assistant for the history department and sociology departments as well. Um, one of those internships in particular was at the US Embassy in London, where I interned as an analyst in the consular section of the immigrant visa unit. So the immigrant visa unit is um, applicants apply to have permanent residency in the United States so they can come over because they're married to a US citizen, they have a job over here, um, any, any number of levels. So I was in that unit. Um, while I was there, you know, I learned a lot about uh, what it's like to represent the United States abroad in, in a capacity. Um, grassroots diplomacy was very important as well. Um, before this, I had really no idea what Foreign Service was, and I just dove right in and uh, great exposure to it. And that really inspired me to look more into this type of type of work, type of service, and kind of that's how my goal emerged of becoming a Foreign Service Officer, U.S. Diplomat in the future. Did a lot of work here, wrote the first standard operating procedure for the Immigrant Visa Unit, 
which is now my legacy of that um, uh, here at here at embassy here at our embassy. Um, I learned a lot about the careers, great diplomats, great folks I met and still have been in contact with from that internship experience. Um, good time for sure. And also, of course, you know, the fun social aspect to it as well. Living in London as a, as a young person is very fun as well. <laughs> um, after I graduated from Grinnell, I immediately went to the University of Cambridge in England. Um, so I, I have two master's degree degrees. Um, at Cambridge, I, I got a master of philosophy, so an MPhil degree in early modern history. My dissertation that I wrote on was entitled Gin Excise in the Satirical Print in London from 1720 to 1760. Um, as a historian, I'm very interested in the history of intoxicants. So looking at the intersection between the political, social, and cultural of such things as gin, wine, whiskey, cognac, um, as well as the drug side too. So opium, cocaine, and the impacts of that historically and as well into the present. And as Liz mentioned, um, I also interned co concurrently with my time at Cambridge um, for the Office of the Historian for the U.S. Department of State. Um, my focuses were Cote d'Ivoire, Sudan, South Sudan, Djibouti, Tanzania. Um, really, in high school and as an undergrad, I didn't have uh, many classes that offered um, a history of the continent of Africa. Um, so this was definitely a deep dive and a lot of teaching myself the histories of these countries and our relate and the U.S.'s relationship with these countries as well. So again, that further inspired me, starting with my internship at the embassy with this one and connecting those two elements to, to my focus of um, interest in North in Northern Africa and um, the U.S.'s role, specifically foreign service and diplomacy um, in that region. So going on to LSE, um, so this photo over here, uh, the LSE's mascot is. Um, the beaver. Um, so that's me with the with the mascot there. So we were able to take um, multiple courses for my degree, which was a Master of Science in International Relations, so an MSc in International Relations. Um, in the in the sections in bold here are the titles of my courses, and then the bullet points um, in quotations are questions that were posed throughout the courses. Um, so the first one here, my conflict and peace building class, right, a really core course. Um, for my interest in conflict and peace building as in, in diplomacy. Some, some topics that we talked about included the war peace dichotomy, identity and conflict, so looking at nationhood, race, ethnicity, religion, class and gender. Um, we talked about failed and weak states, colonialism, uh, liberal peace, pacifism, reconstruction, transitional justice, democratization, and diasporas. Um, and then one of the key questions that really followed us throughout the entire year was, can and does humanitarian assistance build peace? Um, and that was a very stimulating uh, question. It garnered a lot of um, comments from, from my peers in class um, and was really thought provoking. I really enjoyed this class. The second class here, international politics, um, was a core course that every student on this master's program had to take. It's very much so based in theory. So we talked about um, the theories of idealism, realism, um, neoliberalism, the English school, constructivism, um, neo-Marxism, uh, and democratic peace theory for some of those things. And again, this is, for instance, when in one of our seminar discussions, that, that was a question posed. Is our understanding of international politics best advanced through macroanalysis or mid-level very cerebral um, class for sure. Uh, definitely made me think um, and a lot of knowledge was gained it, regarding theory. My third class, um, Nationalist Conflict, Political Violence and Terrorism, particularly enjoyed. I thought the readings were, were um, very well done, very thought provoking. And of course our class discuss discussions were, were just as equally thought provoking. Um, some of the topics that we discussed in, in that class included um, ethics, liberty, radicalization and recruitment, um, genocide. Uh, we talked about the case studies of Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the Northern Ireland conflict. And then we um, looked at, for the first time in this class, uh, the radical right and white supremacism. We also critiqued definitions along the way. So what does it really mean to be 
is is it different is there a difference between being a criminal bomber or a terrorist bomber things like that and then so these are some of the the questions again that uh, led some of our class discussions right is there a difference between a political murder and criminal murder and then white supremacist violence and examples of those um, my other class gender and political violence uh, was um, one in which we talked about a lot women um, in non-state armed groups of so women as terrorists. We talked about gender and genocide um, uh, and sexual violences in conflict. So that class two, um, again, a, a lot of interesting readings. We watched several documentaries that were very thought provoking. Um, and one of the questions too that, you know, also very thought provoking, in what ways are protests at the Olympics related to gender and political violence? That in it itself um, garnered a lot of interesting um, topics and uh, positions. And uh, finally, my dissertation. Um, so that was on top of taking all these classes, we were supposed to come up with our own research, our own research question topic. And, and mine was really looking at white nationalism in US foreign policy um, and, and, and looking um, kind of at examples, um, arguments on both sides of that, of that issue. And really the goal of, of my dissertation was to study the process of how core foreign policy agenda items, particularly economic protectionism policies um, and immigration policies are where, what they are today. So um, I'm very interested in understanding what white nationalism is, um, its relationship with US domestic and foreign policy um, and where uh, it could take our country in the future. Um, and also, I didn't include this here, but I took an Arabic language class. Uh, um, it was, that was very tough, <laughs> to be very honest with you. Um, it was a year long, um, very immersive, uh, rigorous for sure. Um, so that is just kind of like a culmination of my time at LSE. Um, my non-academic time before I um, escaped the pandemic in London, I graduated from Cambridge in October of 2019. So there I am and all my regalia with my diploma. I was able to get up to Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, beautiful city, uh, it, gorgeous, uh, architectural, everything. And then I even made it across the channel to uh, visit Paris, France. I also got up to Normandy um, to see the uh, US um, cemetery there for our fallen soldiers. Um, it was uh, uh, very sobering, absolutely. And uh, just kind of to conclude and then open up for some questions here. Um, my upbringing, uh, growing up on a farm in Iowa, plus my internships, my undergrad at Cambridge, kind of all culminated to lead me to Rotary and also LSE. Um, my goal of, of wanting to get into the Foreign Service and to have that understanding of service and being part of something bigger than myself, I saw that aligning very much so with Rotary. And of course, LSE is a world-renowned um, educational institution for uh, foreign policy and diplomacy. Um, I also found that LSE and my master's degree really helped me uh, gain the tools and frameworks in which to approach actual real life issues happening in Northern Africa, as well as throughout the world of genocide, war, um, and in number of things. And of course, both the Rotary and my time at LSE um, gave me very good exposure to a professional network as well as personal networks and to grow to um, as an individual. So that is my spiel here. So I'll get out of here and open up that. Sydney, very okay. impressive. Thank you. Um, I, I have, oh, Liz has a question uh, and we'll also entertain other questions. If there's questions, you can put them in the chat. Raise your hand if we can. We'll try to see your hand. Uh, it looks like Liz raised her hand for a question. Right, because I couldn't type fast enough for Sydney. <laughs> Sydney, how many, um, were you in a co cohort in your group? I mean, did you have like 30 students, 40 students? How many people were in your cohort and where did they come from? Right, so this was actually the largest um, cohort for this master's program um, in about 10 years. So we had 100 students um, in this cohort for the National Relations Department. And uh, they came from all over the globe, uh, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, Australia, Canada, Mexico, um, of course, England. 
So a lot of um, engaging discussions about what's going on with, with each country's government, um, foreign policy. It, it was a very good mix of individuals there. We have a question from Max Porter. Max, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question to Sydney. Max, let's see. Still muted, Max. Karen, can you help? Go on to Mark Edelman. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mark, Mark Edelman's Mark. hand is okay. up. Mark has a question. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, Sydney, uh, uh, I hadn't seen uh, the terms nationalism and white nationalism because you could have one without the other, uh, perhaps. Uh, and kind of what your thoughts are on where we're headed. Uh, we've heard a lot of discussion about uh, globalism versus nationalism. And uh, of course, we depend a lot on trade. Uh, and that has a lot to do with trade uh, in terms of international policy. Where do you come out in terms of the best way to, to promote global development? Oh man, that's, isn't that the $100 million question? Uh, <laughs> um, man, it's a complicated one for sure, because we built our economy on globalization, the free market since the 80s. So to disentangle that is very difficult. We're seeing that with China. Um, in, in our relationship with that country, especially over the pandemic. Um, what would be interesting would, would be to, um, I think the, the, the nationalism sentiment is, is one that was at least heard in, in the last election of 2016, for electing President Trump. Um, and, and obviously we see that, that there is a huge grievance with that. And, and in my work, I was very much so, there is a legitimate concern there and, and it does touch a lot, especially small towns. I'm from Newton. And we had the Maytag Corporation here. And of course, you know, there was issues with that and competition with overseas markets and all that. So I understand, and it does destroy communities how um, these uh, corporations just kind of flee and, and go to where it's cheaper to, to have um, workers. So there is definite grievances. Um, again, I'm not sure what type of policies need to be put in place, but I do think that protectionism you know, trade wars are not the way to go because it ultimately ends up hurting um, average workers. Uh, but to see that it is being discussed now on a, on a large scale, especially with the last presidential election, um, is we need to have it out there for sure. Uh, that, it, that it hasn't worked, globalization hasn't worked for everyone. Uh, although statistically it has helped make the world a less dangerous place. So again, it's all very conflicting. Nothing's really black and white. It's, it's all, a lot of it's in the gray area. So I guess that's my best answer. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Thanks. Uh, looks like we have a few more questions for you here, Sydney, in our chat. Um, Liz asks, are there any students from East Africa? Would be one question. And I can answer that. I only ran into one and they were from Somaliland. Um, great conversations with that individual. Uh, learned a lot for sure about the internal politics of that country. Uh, yeah, that's the only one, only individual that I ran into from East Africa. And, and Glenn Ripke asks about um, how a common issue is how do we get more young people interested in foreign service? Do you have any thoughts on that? I hear you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is a tough one. Um, I, yeah, you, you know, again, I, you know, I don't know what it was you know, growing up on a farm. I didn't, we didn't travel at all growing up. So I don't know what the heck's wrong with me. I, I like that foreign policy sort of stuff and foreign service. I like the adventure and maybe that's a way you could get it, get it attractive to young people traveling the world type of thing. Um, but service for sure has definitely been one thing and, you know, being part of something bigger than yourself. Um, I think a lot of young people do want that sense of purpose and putting it towards the United States and representing the country at the very best light abroad, um, I think is one way to, to attract young people to foreign service, foreign policy. Which is kind of in line with this next question from Jeff is um, really what developed your curiosity and how your family grew to support your feeding of your curiosity. <laughs> oh man. Um, 
Yeah. These are easy questions, yeah. right? Super, super easy. <laughs> no, um, like I said, my, my experience growing up in Newton, Iowa with Maytag, um, you know, and how that affected my family economically. Um, and then I went to, to Grinnell College, which is incredibly diverse, um, people from all over the world. And I got to just engage with those folks. They learned a lot about me and the community I'm from, and I learned a lot about them and where they're from. And so just to see folks on a human level and, and you know, their ideas about policy versus mine, I, it really just excited me. And so Grinnell really helped that, getting that internship at the U.S. Embassy in London just really excited Exploded. This is definitely a career. Um, for me, it's something that it could really just bundle all my interests. So uh, that's kind of in a nutshell, I guess, an answer. Uh, and then uh, Liz asks, what's the process uh, for going forward and getting to be a foreign service officer? Uh, it's a lengthy one. You have to take several tests, um, several interviews, and then you have to go to Washington, D.C. and do more group interviews. Um, and then you're put on a, a registrar, so just a list of hundreds of folks, and your, your placement on there depends on how well you score on the tests as well as the interviews, um, and then you could be on there for 18 months and then taken off if you're never called up. Um, it all just depends on the needs of the department, so it could be a very lengthy, lengthy process. And then uh, Max Porter uh, was a, unable to ask your question because of a microphone issue, but he was wondering, um, have you noticed any issues based on your work that you have observed uh, in relation to the closing of Grinnell classes? Oh, um, no, no, not really. Um, I do find their approach, their hybrid approach very interesting. They have five semesters this year and they're bringing different groups of, of students to campus. I, I, that was one of the most uh, interesting approaches to dealing with COVID and, and still having classes. Um, but of course, you know, things change. So, yeah. And Jeff, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the second part of my question. Talk to us a little bit about your family in terms of how they embraced your curiosity. I mean, you have a child going international like this. Uh, Talk us through that, and, and I don't know if we heard brothers and sisters, uh, how large was your family? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, <laughs> so I do have a younger sister. She's two years younger. She just graduated from Central College. Um, she too, like me, um, you know, wants to just see the world and get out there. She spent um, a semester studying in Wales when I was at Cambridge, so we had a great time traversing across the, the United Kingdom together for, for a while. Um, but yeah, so my family um, <clears throat> a lot of anxiety whenever I, I, I told my mom, yeah, I got this internship in London at the U.S. Embassy. She's like, okay, how's that going to, how's that going to work? <laughs> so it's never, she, she's always been very, very supportive of, of anything that, you know, any, my sister and myself are interested in, which, I mean, hands down, fantastic, right? Um, and, and luckily too, I mean, she's always, you know, very the logistics. Okay, where are you gonna live? Um, how are you gonna feed yourself? All that sort of stuff. And then I, you know, <laughs> kind of that's the second, second tier that I think of. Um, but she definitely keeps me grounded in that sense. Um, and then of course, you know, she, she didn't get her passport until she was 50 years old. And that was because of me going over to London. So for her too, and you know, I've interned in New York City as well. And I, she'd never been. So she crossed the Brooklyn Bridge with me for the first time. Uh, you know, just sort of stuff like that. Getting to experience that stuff um, with her has, has been really great. And I, I, you know, another thing that we can share too are experiences abroad um, as well as just different parts in this country. Um, so it's, it's been a mutual kind of exploration um, and both enjoyment at the same time. Yeah. Uh you know, Bill Tubbs asks, what's next? And will you stay involved with Rotary? It's a great question. Um, I mean, Rotary is definitely something in the future that I would, I would really want to be engaged with. Right now, I'm just trying to um, make some money, get a savings going. I did just recently start a job as a corporate paralegal and contract specialist at a corporation in Chicago. I'm currently working uh, remotely at, in Newton. Um, very lucky to get that job uh, during COVID in particularly. Um, so that is, you know, just giving me exposure into the workforce. Like I said, getting it, getting a savings, that sort of thing. Um, and then through this time, I'll be studying for that foreign service officer exam. 
uh, and then continuing to engage in different networks that I've um, become a part of with the Foreign Service and Foreign Policy. Uh, yeah, that's, that's where I am now. Yeah, and Warren Madden asks, uh, what impact has this current COVID-19 crisis had on your career plans? Uh, it, it definitely is a roadblock, or I guess maybe a good old pothole. I'm not sure <laughs> the best way to visualize that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the diplomats that I have in, in my network are back stateside. Um, so one from uh, in South, South Africa, Johannesburg, and he, he was forced back into D.C., um, right at the beginning around March. So it's, it's definitely pumping the brakes on uh, diplomacy. And of course, until countries open back up, um, it's, it's put a lot of question into a lot of my plans personally, as well as the State Department too. Well, that's, that's good. Um, anyone else wanna <laughs> have any questions uh, specifically for Sydney? It's been, you've done such a, oh, is that Georgia? Or Georgia, are you wiping off your iPad, or do you have a question? I'm I'm putting my hand up. Um, I just wanted to ask Sydney, and I this is a tough question, and I probably missed it somewhere. But what does LSE stand for? Right, the London School of Economics. Okay, I thought it was London something. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you. Good question. Anyone else? Yes. Chad, this is Jim Patton. Yeah, Jim. Maybe Sydney could comment about how she and other students that she was working with heard news from the U.S. and uh, what their impression is of what's going on in the U.S. Right. Um, yeah, uh, it's very interesting over there to, to read the different news outlets. So I was reading a lot of the BBC um, uh, over there and their interpretation of what was going on in the United States and then comparing that to what US news organizations like the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post had of that, those same issues. Um, and of course, my friends and I, we would uh, kind of uh, compare the facts or the opinions on those things. So, I mean, that in of itself was very eye-opening too, right? How different nations look at each other and how an own nation looks at themselves. Um, I, I, yeah, I, that was, uh, was eye-opening for sure. Just the comparisons in of them themselves, yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else have questions for Sydney while we have her this morning or this yeah, afternoon? Yeah, Sydney, don't be so careful in your answer to that last question. <laughs> How was America viewed? Oh, bad. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I would say um, the the Brits are very conflicted uh, about uh, about what's going on over here for sure. I mean, they themselves have their own issues with it and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in terms of the current administration, uh, they're kind of petrified, I, to be quite honest, um, about what's going on over here. Um, but at the same time, I mean, they're petrified themselves of what's going on in their own country. Uh, so yeah, that's, I think that's the, the best answer I can get. Just very confused um, and uh, I, very, very involved in what this next election is, is going to have in store. Absolutely. They're following it very closely over there. Do you have any interactions with your local Rotary Club? Here, here in America or over there? In London? Uh, over there, Liz is asking. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Stella, she, she was kind of my contact. Um, she I, just uh, amazing human being. Um, she, she's been working with other um, Rotary scholars for 30 years. She, she loves engaging, and most of them Americans, she loves engaging uh, with uh, American young people, um, picking their brains. Uh, we've been emailing back and forth over the summer here, and uh, you know, she's cooped up inside, of course, and so complaining about that, which I totally understand. And uh, yeah, just, we've been keeping in touch for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jean Cressy wanted to clarify with that, probably with the pandemic, when, when did you actually return to the US, Sydney? Yeah, I got back uh, March, so three days before Boris Johnson shut down London. I got out of just in the nick of time. <laughs> There's a lot of stories like that. Oof, yeah. That was great. Good mm -hmm. questions. Good, good presentation. And uh, 
Yeah, once again, Liz, thanks. If you're if you're the one that helped organize that, I appreciate that. Sydney, thank you so much for your time, and you're such a good uh, young speaker, presenter, very knowledgeable. Nice. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you to all of you Rotarians. Again, consistently uh, today, 52 people on a Zoom meeting, um, all sharing in fellowship, but also just uh, uh, a testament to the great programs that we have also. And uh, all the great members of our club. Next week, we actually will have um, Anika Mundell, United Way Fall Campaign Discussion. So that's next week's program. Uh, looking forward to that. And then, um, you know, thought for the day, just knowing that Sydney's involved with international peace, uh, it's pretty easy to find a lot of quotes on peace and thoughts on peace, but I think one that might make transcend lots of quotes on peace would be uh, that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King Jr. And with that, uh, if you'll join me, we'll say our four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>